On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat in the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up, and he rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe, and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Thank you. The storm came out of nowhere. We were out on Table Rock Lake in Cousin Bert's 17-foot ski boat miles away from the cabin that promised shelter from the squall. My dad looked up to see clouds steel gray and heavy with rain tumbling over the cliffs and rolling in down the lake. So we snatched up the skis, reeled in the rope, and snapped on the boat's canvas cover, which was our only defense against the wind and the rain. As we sped full throttle toward the resort, the lake churned beneath us, causing the little boat to bounce violently across the waves. With each rumble of thunder, I grew more and more nervous that my five-foot frame would fly overboard. So I hit the floor and pressed my body against the wooden planks covering the storage hatch in the middle of the boat until we pulled safely into the dock. That storm over Table Rock paled in comparison to the one Mark describes rolling in over Galilee and threatening the disciples' journey. This is no ordinary windstorm. The tempest is strong enough to make a boat full of professional fishermen fear for their lives. Elsewhere, the Greek word is translated hurricane. So it seems we're talking about winds strong enough to rip the roof off your house, scattering shingles in the schoolyard blocks away. This is not the kind of storm you enjoy from the screened-in porch on a summer evening. It's the kind that sends you scrambling to board up your windows and stop up on bottled water. And those poor disciples, they are caught in the middle of it, trapped on a small wooden boat far from shore. Peter had not checked the weather forecast. James had no time to grab the life jackets. Andrew had held his tongue, even though he knew it would have been prudent to wait until morning. Instead, the disciples heeded Christ's call to go across to the other side. Though darkness was closing in, and they had not prepared for the journey. So here they are, bailing water out of the boat as gale force winds threaten to topple each and every one of them into the sea. Yet Jesus, the one who got them into this mess, Jesus is oblivious to the danger at hand. Despite howling winds and raging waves, Jesus is asleep, curled up on a pillow at the back of the boat. The disciples shake him awake. Teacher, they cry, do you not care that we are perishing? Of course he does care, and he responds accordingly, but even as chaos overwhelms them, even before the winds fall silent and the waves grow still, Jesus is at peace. The storm does not faze him. I suppose his calm could have something to do with his authority over the wind and waves, but I think there's more to it. You see, for Mark's Jesus, peril comes with the territory. 
It's all part of carrying out his ministry. On this point, I am indebted to the scholarship of Matt Skinner, professor of New Testament at Luther Seminary. As he observes in his commentary on this text, Jesus is drawn to liminal spaces. He's drawn to in-between spaces, to sites of transition and risk. There is the graveyard, which blurs the line between the living and the dead, and the sickbed of Jairus' daughter, where she languishes on the brink of death, and the cross, where Jesus hangs between this world and the next. And there are geographical boundaries as well, mountains and deserts and cities that are on the edge of something else, and of course, the sea, the Sea of Galilee, that body of water that separates the Jews from the Gentiles. All liminal spaces, in between spaces. Time and again, Jesus shows up in these borderlands, Sites where people cross the dividing lines between what is known and what is foreign. Between what is safe and what is threatening. These are liminal spaces in between spaces. As the story before us illustrates, these spaces are perilous. The storm that rages over the sea just highlights the risk inherent in crossing over to the other side. It is a journey that forces the disciples to come toe-to-toe with death as they face the very real threat of being swallowed up by the sea. Yet Jesus is compelled to go. Even though they had not planned this voyage, even though they cannot reach the far shore before nightfall, Jesus commands his disciples to set out across the sea. As Matt Skinner points out, nothing will inhibit his desire to do ministry on the other side. So Jesus and his disciples journey into this liminal space, this in-between space. And before they can cross the Sea of Galilee, a violent storm blows in and threatens their very life. I can no longer read this text without thinking of another borderland, of another in-between space flooded with people who dared cross over to the other side. As the news from our southern border so tragically illustrates, this journey is also full of risk. For here, too, a storm is raging. At this boundary which separates one people from another, Heartless winds rip children out of their parents' arms, and waves of cruelty batter migrants who are already drowning, already gasping for air as the seas of gang violence and political turmoil inundate their homelands. Thanks be to God, the president has put an end to the practice of separating families at the border. But the storm has left devastation in its wake. This policy has traumatized the traumatized, inflicting emotional distress that may have consequences for years to come. And still, parents languish in jail cells, distraught because they do not know the whereabouts of their children. And children, toddlers, babies, cry out for their parents from makeshift cages. It breaks my heart. I imagine it breaks yours, too. It is a crisis that blurs our own dividing lines between Democrat and Republican, between proponents of the wall and immigration advocates, because we can all agree that tearing apart families who are seeking asylum Tearing apart these families is wrong. It's cruel. It is unjust. It is immoral. And as the Church of Jesus Christ, we cannot ignore the suffering of our neighbors. 
We must raise our voices and echo their lament. Do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care that we are drowning, that we are gasping for air as the wind and waves threaten to destroy us? It is the cry of those caught in the storm at our southern border, on the Sea of Galilee, at every borderland where people stand toe to toe with the forces of death. Do you not care that we are perishing? The good news, of course, is that Christ is there, ready to respond to his people's cries. As scripture reminds us time and again, Jesus shows up in liminal spaces, in in-between spaces. And wherever he goes, the forces of death are defeated. In the graveyard, Jesus casts out the unclean spirit that has tormented a man for years, freeing him to embrace a future away from the tombs. And at the sickbed, he rescues a little girl from the clutches of death, restoring her to life and to community. And on the cross, death exacted on Good Friday yields to a triumphant Easter. And here, here on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus overpowers the forces of destruction and death, silencing the wind and calming the waves and restoring peace. Christ is there in the midst of the storm in places that seem beyond hope or redemption. And because Jesus dared to cross over to the other side, sites of risk become sites of resurrection. Wherever he goes, the sick receive healing and the captives find release. The abandoned are restored to community and broken families are made whole. Wherever Jesus goes, the winds of destruction fall silent and waves return to their normal rhythms. Wherever he goes, creation enjoys the gift of peace. Yes, the good news is that Christ is there, ensuring that life will always, always conquer death. Friends, as the church, we must follow Christ into these borderlands to offer hope in places that seem hopeless. For Jesus calls his disciples, saying, let us go across to the other side. And thanks be to God, the church is heeding that call. The church is there at our southern border, bearing witness to Christ's presence in the midst of the storm. A friend and colleague has been sharing her experience of mission in the border town of McAllen, Texas. A group from her congregation spent the past week serving alongside Catholic charities, sorting donations which have flooded in from all across the country, and serving refugees released from detention who need food and clothing and a safe place to sleep. The church is at the border acting as the hands and feet of Christ. And the church is offering a prophetic voice, calling for compassion in letters to representatives, demanding justice and statements of public faith. Just this past Thursday, our denomination's General Assembly took a stand to affirm the dignity of all human beings and to call for our country to protect the most vulnerable among us. The church is in the midst of the storm, echoing Christ's call for peace. The church is there, carrying out the mission and ministry of Jesus wherever storms rage. And through its witness as the body of Christ, the Spirit is present, offering hope, proclaiming peace, opening the way to life. Sisters and brothers, let us cross to the other side. Our Lord is already there. <laughs>